Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck Part 29. You seemed so familiar to me when we were introduced, I thought right away that I'd seen you before. These words were spoken to me in the early 1960s by retired British Rear Admiral Keith McNeil Campbell Walter on the manicured lawn of King's House in Kingston, Jamaica, at a reception being given by the Governor General, Sir Kenneth Blackburn. As a former father-in-law of the industrialist Heinrich von thyssen Misa, who had carried Campbell's beautiful daughter, the ex-model Fiona Campbell Walter's name, had long been a familiar one in the society columns. At the moment he and his wife were taking a short vacation on the enchanting Caribbean island, where they were staying in an expensive property belonging to the industrialist on Jamaica's north coast. Sir Kenneth and Lady Blackburn had invited my wife and me this time not only as the German ambassadorial couple I was then the German ambassador to Jamaica with consular jurisdiction in the British Caribbean but also so that two former officers of once warring navies could meet. Sir Kenneth himself laughed at the sea and seafaring, was an enthusiastic and successful sailor and commodore of the Royal Yacht Club in Jamaica and was interested in naval history. In 1960 he had insisted that I go with him to see the film Sink the Bismarck in Kingston. He was one of those who encouraged me to write someday about the German battleship. I now looked closely at Campbell Water. I'm sorry, Admiral. Unfortunately, I can't say the same. Do you still remember, he continued, the drinks party in Chelsea in 1941? I tried to sound you out there about the Bismarck's radio equipment and transmissions. I had a microphone under my lapel. The receiver was in the cellar, but you didn't say anything. And who had thought up this outing to London and planned its details in the first place? None other than Ian Fleming, later the creator of James Bond. Admiral Godfrey had taken him, a former stockbroker, bright and shrewd, to be his personal assistant after entering the post of Director of Naval Intelligence in 1939. Fleming, quick-witted, good-looking and sophisticated, had earlier considered and prepared himself for entry into the army or the diplomatic service. Now, as a lieutenant in the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve, he was assigned to Room 39, where he acted as the ideal man. Without any experience at sea, he, through his flexibility, broke up, or relaxed, many of the naval orthodoxies around Godfrey and enlivened the department with his brainstorms, usable or not. Two may be selected from the number that bore fruit. One, in 1941, with the aim of capturing secret materials from a German weather reporting ship in the Atlantic, was later carried out successfully. The other, copied from the example of the German paratroopers who seized British materials in Crete in 1941, was accomplished three years thereafter in Germany by a commando team that captured from the German Kriegsmarine tons of archival material of inestimable value to the British Admiralty. While I was sitting in Cockfosters, someone may well have recalled my activity on the staff of the naval attaché at our London embassy in 1938-1939 and have regarded my ideological conversion to the British side as conceivable and so given Fleming the idea for the outing. Fleming then turned its planning over to the deputy chief of the German prisoners of war subsection, his friend Eddie Crowen. The latter, around 35 years old, plump and black-haired, fluent in German and previously a much sought-after interior decorator in London, had taken over the arrangements for the evening. Crowen had obtained his position as deputy subsection chief through Fleming's initiative. He was for his chief, Trench, what Fleming was for Godfrey, the idea man. To be sure, Trench was sharp-witted, but he was also conventional and simple-hearted. His hobby was knitting. Therefore, as Fleming saw it, Trench too needed a spark plug. This role was now played by Crowen, who prior to Izzard's arrival at Cockfosters had composed the written reports of the interrogations of prisoners. He himself never took part in them on a regular basis and only came to Cockfosters now and then when some point had to be cleared up. Our London outing had not been cheap. The Admiralty paid for it, for no other German prisoners would it ever again spend so much money for such a reason. The standard outing for prisoners, giving reason for ideological hopes, led to the fixed price menu at Simpsons on the Strand, the quantity and quality of which were surprisingly good for the price, and afterwards to a part of the city upon which the Luftwaffe liked to claim it had inflicted extensive damage. It did not fail to leave an impression, for example, to see St. Paul's standing intact in the midst of ruins. To my knowledge, however, a very different kind of special treatment was extended to a nephew of Martin Niemöller, a U-boat officer. 
He was deeply religious and had repeatedly told his interrogating officer of his desire to participate in a divine service. Accordingly, orders came from London to take him to church. On three Sundays, two interrogating officers escorted Niemöller's nephew and another German officer to various churches, St. Albans Abbey, Stokes Page Church and St. George's Chapel in Windsor Castle. Each time the German officers knew all the hymns in the service and, to the embarrassment of their British escorts, loudly joined in singing the words in German. And the results, as regards an ideological conversion of special treatment in Niemöller's case and mine, nil. Churchill was always after the Naval Intelligence Department to designate a German officer whom he could present to the British public as a symbol of crumbling morale in the Reich. But Cockfosters always had to report that the German's discipline remained very high. A suitable German officer was not found in Great Britain until the beginning of 1944, somewhat earlier in the USA, and only a few enlisted men had come forward before that. And what with an invitation to an ideological conversion, which was at no time substantively addressed to me, have really meant to me personally? Since 1937 to 1938 I had recognized the inevitability of our national ruin under the Brown tyranny and the urgent necessity of Hitler's disappearance in our national political interest, but of course I had regarded this as a purely internal political problem. Certainly, it had increased the spiritual torment to be compelled to see more clearly from year to year that, in view of the Germans' political apathy, this goal would never be attained internally, but now through war or, at any rate, through its outcome. The millions of deaths throughout the world constricted in its meaning to a change of government in one's own country? It was a cruel dilemma, but it could never serve as a bridge for an ideological conversion. Ideologically, in terms of my basic political and constitutional persuasions, there had been for a long time nothing to convert. I had never allowed myself to be infected with the poison of the so-called National Socialism. And from the beginning I had firmly rejected a conversion on the grounds of possibly betraying military secrets. Also under prisoner of war conditions nothing remained but to continue withdrawing into myself and further to await the day of the internal decay of the Brown system. It was indeed in its nature to overextend itself internally and externally and one day it would collapse under the boundlessness of its military aggression. Gradually I came no longer to have the shadow of doubt of this. I'm afraid I can't help you at the moment, said the station doctor at Cockfasters. The best thing would be for you to wait a while and if it doesn't get any better we can always take another look. It was a late summer morning in 1941 and the day had not begun very pleasantly for me. Quite suddenly I had felt indeterminate stomach pains and had to vomit repeatedly without evident cause. I couldn't make rhyme or reason of it. As the trouble wouldn't go away, I finally asked the floor sentry if I could see the doctor. After the latter's words I looked at him, rather at the loss, and then he was gone. When the afternoon brought no improvement, I asked to see the doctor again. This time he didn't come in person but only sent a message. If you have pain, you must put up with it. How to describe my surprise when, shortly before midnight, my cell door burst open and a doctor and his staff, no less than five people, walked in briskly. Pack right away. You're going to a hospital and will be operated on tomorrow morning, I heard before I had any idea for what I was to be operated on. And at noon the next day a surgeon in a white smock leaned over my bed. Well, that was high time. You really had a burst appendix. I thanked him. It's a good thing that I came into your hands while there was still time left. By degrees I discovered where I now found myself. In Hatfield House, a manor house about 30 kilometers north of London built at the beginning of the 17th century by Robert Cecil, the first Earl of Salisbury and Prime Minister under King James I and in the possession of the Cecil family for nearly four centuries now. It was surrounded by a great park and built according to a plan beloved since the time of Queen Elizabeth I, two wings joined by a central element which formed the outline of an E, the first letter of the great Queen's name. Its exquisite interiors included marvelous paintings, choice furniture, rare gobelin tapestries, historical arms and armor and, in the chapel, an original Flemish stained glass window of biblical themes. Now this castle had been converted into a military hospital for the duration of the war. As a German prisoner of war I lay, separated from the Allied patients, on the upper floor of the West Wing. The windows of my spacious room provided a charming view of the Elizabethan garden, which I was repeatedly assured still looked exactly as it had in the time of Elizabeth I when a predecessor of the present building had stood here. 
In such beautiful surroundings, cared for by two pretty nurses, I could get along very well, even if at first I let all the food offered me pass unenjoyed for lack of appetite. When I began feeling better and the days seemed longer, at my request a friendly auxiliary brought me a copy of Erskine Childers' The Riddle of the Sands from the House Library. The novel had appeared in 1903 and made use of the author's observations on a voyage along the German North Sea and Baltic coasts in 1897. At the time he had felt that the German activity there portended an invasion threat for England, an incredible thesis which the London Admiralty later declared to be absurd. Nevertheless, Childers developed it in such an absorbing manner that the book immediately became a great success. His descriptions of everyday life in a small sailboat were fascinating in themselves. I had first become entwined in the book following a suggestion from my gunnery instructor at the Mervik Naval School in 1931, Kapitän zur See Günther Paschen. Paschen was a good judge of English literature. All at once I had to think of him as one of the strongest and most independent-minded characters I had ever encountered. At the time I had no foreboding of his cruel fate. Günther Paschen was born in 1880, the son of a vice-admiral and a mother of Danish origin. During the Battle of Jutland on May 31, 1916, he was the chief gunnery officer in the battlecruiser Lützow, which sank early on the day after the action as a result of the damage she had sustained. He had shot rapidly and with great success at the British capital ships Princess Royal, Black Prince, Indefatigable and Warspite. Later he wrote, Jutland Day on the Lützow, the flagship of the commander of the scouting forces, Vice Admiral Hipper, represents the high point of my career as a naval and gunnery officer. Memories of a great and fine work in the service of the cherished weapon bind me to the ship and her crew. Into the battleworthiness of this ship I put all the knowledge and ability that service and study had given me. A recipient of the Iron Cross First Class, Paschen had been discharged in 1919 and taught as an instructor at the Mervik Naval School from 1926 to 1936. In my mind's eye, his tall figure now stood again before me there, his face aglow with intelligence and determination deeply absorbed during instruction in his favorite weapon or at ballistic demonstrations on the grounds of the naval school. Married to an Englishwoman, he had a complete mastery of the English language, shunning the American slang that was becoming increasingly current in Germany and, in his manner, cultivating an English charm. He had seen through the mendacity of National Socialism from the beginning, his opposition to the regime was widely known, for on occasion he had spoken his mind, imprudent in a police state. At the end of August 1943, Paschen opened his home to two unknown Danes who supposedly wished to rent a room but were actually Nazi agent provocateurs who had come to involve him in compromising conversations. They succeeded in short order. Paschen said that he did not believe in a German victory and that the Führer's secret weapons were just a bluff. As his mother was a Dane, he spoke her language, went hunting in northern Schleswig and spent a good deal of time in Denmark. He also believed that this country had been wronged in 1864 and that the Reich should give Schleswig back to Denmark. One of the two Danes later repeated these remarks to a female naval auxiliary with whom he had relations. That was enough for the People's Court to condemn Paschen. In private conversation in his own home with citizens of an occupied country, the accused had made a public attack on the German military potential and that of an allied people. On November 8, 1943, Günther Paschen was murdered in Brandenburg prison by Hitler's henchmen. He had refused to appeal for mercy. Räder, who on private occasions used to stress the strength of his Christian convictions, did not intercede with Hitler in favor of Paschen, even after the latter's daughter Ruth implored him by letter to do so. He did not even answer Ruth's letter. Nor did any of the doomed officer's crewmates step forward to offer a helping hand. Everyone seemed frozen in fear of the Führer. In 1951, Professor Dr. Karl Römer, ship's surgeon on the Lützow in Paschen's day, wrote a friend of the family, Your friendly card continues to move me greatly. Oh, that the noble Paschen was put to death. But it seems thoroughly fitting for the upright man. Already on SMS Lützow, he was the strong character. You know that of all the officers, he was always the one for whom I really had respect. You had to know him, this tall man with a thinker's forehead and a face full of character, who spoke little and impressed us surgeons as kind and courtly. Everyone spoke of him with respect. Everyone knew that he was really the one who got things done. When he came to the table, frequently late, you knew that he came from work. In humanity and character he was, in fact, the best. You probably know that he scored a hit with the first shot from the Lützow. 
Furthermore, he impressed me in the most exceptional way. It was probably in April 1916, in a disagreement with other officers, that he remarked that British reports were accurate, while ours were, well, I'll say, coloured. He was the only one who saw that at the time, and from then on, I was certain that we would lose the war. And from then on, I fell silently bound to him by the knowledge that the struggle was hopeless. Please give his wife my heartfelt and respectful regards from one in whose memory her husband remains in death a shining example. A shining example, a clear-sighted, perceptive patriot, Günther Paschen. Honor to his memory. Amid more reading and conversation with the medical personnel, the time in Hatfield House flew swiftly past. One day I discovered the attraction of the delicious food and decided to help myself well enough to make up for lost time. I also explained this to my physician, but this was an injudicious remark. If the food tastes so good to you, said the doctor, you're completely well again and can go back to your camp at once. And straight away it was farewell to the meat dishes in Hatfield House and back again to my cell in Cockfosters. Bit of a short one today as I am quite busy at work. Anyway, just when we thought the intelligence gathering methods couldn't get more interesting, we learn about the man who premiered the technique used here, that is, a friendly evening in the pub. It was none other than Ian Fleming himself, the father of James Bond. The first James Bond novel was released in 1953 and there's no doubt that Fleming's experience in the war influenced his story in a great way. We also meet Günther Paschen. Paschen is a hero of the Battle of Jutland, where he directed fire aboard the Lützo. Lützo in this battle was remarkably accurate and only because she was firing semi-armor-piercing ammo instead of full-on armor-piercing shells did she not cause more damage. Paschen was sentenced to death in a mock trial after making compromising statements to strangers and executed by guillotine on November 8, 1943. He, a hero of the Great War, faced the so-called People's Court where the verdict was clear from the start. The presiding judge, Roland Freisler, conceded the trial with the words None of us want anything to do with such a dishonorable traitor. In the last letter to his wife, Paschen said the following. I went into death without fear. Death was the release from weeks of endless physical and mental torment, the continuation of which filled me with dread. My only consolation is that you have been spared my fate. I have asked the local pastor to ensure that my body is transferred to Flensburg and buried there according to Christian rites. I do not want to be buried somewhere here. Unfortunately, his last wish was ignored. He was cremated and his ashes scattered in Brandenburg. And on this rather somber note, thank you for watching anyway. I will see you in the next episode. Stay safe. Cheers. Bye bye.